you cannot do value-based care alone. Anybody who thinks they can, I bet is going to lose. From Advisory Board, we are bringing you a radio advisory, your weekly download on how to untangle healthcare's most pressing challenges. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. Here on Radio Advisory, I talk a lot about the future of value-based care because, honestly, I want to equip health leaders with actionable guidance to make the right investments for meaningful downside risk. And I know that value-based care is challenging, but there is no doubt in my mind that it is the way forward. So today, I kind of want to have a different conversation. I want to talk about the misconceptions or maybe the misaligned expectations that leaders have around value-based care. So I brought Advisory Board's own value-based care expert, Daniel Kuzmanovich, as well as Eric Johnson, the SVP of value-based care for Optum Advisory Services, to talk about the mindset shifts they think leaders should be making when pursuing a sustainable value-based care strategy. Daniel, Eric, welcome to Radio Advisory. Thanks. Nice to be here. Morning, Ray. So the two of you, if I can reveal a little bit about what your real jobs are like when you are not coming on radio advisory, you spend, I think, every day talking with real health leaders about value-based care. And I have to believe that for as many conversations as you have that are hopeful, that are positive, that are really energizing for you, I'm willing to bet that more often than not, there's a conversation with a health leader where you go, oh, that's a red flag. Uh-oh, this is going to cause me to get on my soapbox and say, they're, they're thinking about value-based care totally wrong. What are some of those red flags for you when you talk to health leaders? That they think they can do it quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and they think they can do it off the side of their desk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That'll never happen here. That won't happen to us. It couldn't possibly be me. That's that's one of my favorite ones where folks are they're they're thinking about it, they're discussing it, but their fundamental realization is it 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 doesn't apply to us. Yeah, we can opt out of this. I can just avoid this maybe forever. I also really get frustrated when folks say and, and maybe they say this say this to you when they're asking for advice, can't I just be like Kaiser? Oh gosh, yeah, that <laughs> drives me crazy. Um, for any number of reasons, but the biggest reason is that Kaiser's been doing this for a very long time. It's built into the DNA of the organization. You're not going to replace your DNA DNA over the course of a benefit year if you're trying to start this from scratch. Yeah, it's. It, I hear it a lot, and it drives me nuts every time. I might admit one that I used to say that I, I maybe I'm a bit embarrassed that I, it used to be a, a pretty regular part of the way that I talked about value-based care. Uh, that, that phrase foot in two boats. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my soapbox moment right there. You will hear me when not, when someone brings that over, you'll hear me like metaphorically drag the soapbox and talk <laughs> about how that's not the right way to think about it. There's no magical, there's no, no magical future where we step off of fee for service and solely into value-based care. Totally. I think a lot of our data actually says that many organizations, especially on the plan side, don't want to be in a world that's 100% capitated or 100% value-based. I do think that it is really important that we take some time to bust the myths that are in the market about value-based care. And if I think about the right way to do this, I almost want to do it in segments. And I want to think about the very real journey that health leaders are on, because the truth is they can have different misconceptions based on where they are in their value-based care journey. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying that there hasn't been positive progress. I'm not saying that there aren't success stories in value-based care, but the reality is that there are still a lot of organizations that that are at the very, very beginning of their journey, or maybe they're starting over. So my question is, How do you know when a leader or an organization has the completely wrong mindset before even launching a value-based care strategy? I have, there's a selection bias for me, right? Because if they're talking to me, they're already interested in VBC and paying for consulting to help them get there. So for the most part, that qualifying exercise has already happened. That doesn't mean they're fully aware of the challenges that they're going to face. And And there is some education that that goes into it. I think when they think about this without thinking about it as a growth opportunity, I'm thinking that they haven't fully grasped the challenge ahead because I do think it's, it's about growth for them. 
Um, and I think it's about margin. But I think a lot of times they think of it just in terms of lost volume, in which case they're kind of already self-defeating. The growth point is is really interesting. And it ta- your, your point about lost volume kind of reminds me of one of the things I hear a lot as someone who provides a lot of that, like what education about VBC, when folks don't want to involve the physicians. Uh, one of the advisory board research best practices is to involve and engage your physicians in value-based care. And when someone's like, we're only going to do this in a population health function, or it's only going to be in primary care rather than everything. Separate. Yep. Immediate, immediate red flag. I actually want to talk about both of these, but I'm really intrigued by Eric's comment about growth because that seems like the highest level mindset shift. And if I'm honest about the conversations that I have, I don't think any health leaders, at least in the hospital and health system space, is thinking about value-based care as a growth strategy. In fact, if I think about the very fragile financial state that a lot of these leaders are in, they're telling me, I've got to pull back on my value-based care objective for 2024, maybe even 2025, because I just have to focus on my margin right now. But what I'm hearing you say is that's actually not the right mindset to have. Yeah, I think that 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 is a, a false choice that they end up being forced to make because the competition that they really need to engage on is the competition for lives. Mm. And volume will follow if you win the life. But because in all lines of business, Medicare Advantage, commercial, uh, self-insured lives, getting those lives and having responsibility for them is the fulcrum by which you can actually drive growth. Uh, and you have to manage them. But yeah. There's a lot of myopic thinking that I feel like folks get trapped into. This either or mindset, or even if they're adopting their value-based care strategy, they're saying, oh, but we're going to leave all the physicians out and we're just going to have our population health function focus on this. Exactly like what you were talking about, Daniel. Siloed thinking, myopic thinking. Why is that dangerous when it comes to the success of your overall strategy? This is part of why I hate that expression, a foot in two boats, because it sets up the idea of opposition, whereas growing volumes and growing lives are not actually opposed concepts. At some point in time, you think about life versus volume differently, but they're not opposed. No more dipping your toe in anymore. I mean, this is the the crux of the matter. You got to commit, right? And we call it the burn the boats decision. Like you've got to burn the boats and fight your way off the beach at that point. Mm. And despite all the methodologies, and we've got a lot of methodologies in consulting that can help them get there. The number one criteria that we try to instill is patience. Like you are going to be on this journey for a while and we'll do the math. We'll show them how the math works out over the course of a number of years. And they respond to the math, but you got to commit to the math. Yes. Too. <laughs> That's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And and I, I worry that that is another reason changing your thinking from you have to commit. It can't just be some of your physicians. It can't just be this separate department. It has to be part of your growth strategy. You have to think about 10 and 20 years. That might be that might be fine on an intellectual level, but practically speaking, when it comes to making a decision that's going to move the ball forward for their organization in the next six months, that can be really hard for leaders to connect the dots between the long-term big picture commitment and what I have to do right now. My question for you is, how do you help folks make that change in their mindset? Because they are, to your point at the very beginning, Daniel, thinking, oh, I'm going to make money in the next year or maybe the next two years if, if at the long end. One of the number one indicators of an organization that is likely to be successful in value-based care is if you commit, if if you are willing to get out of that shallow end and into the deep end. Mm. It, this isn't a one-year contract. This isn't even sometimes a three-year contract. We're looking at, I think, uh, UPMC and Allegheny uh, in the Pennsylvania markets. They have like 10-year deals in their value-based mm. arrangements. Uh, I think we heard, Ray, at the Rashika Fernandinopoulos comments in one of your recent live podcasts, Agilon does 20-year de- deals. This is This isn't a short thing. Yeah, the math is a means to the end, and the end is not value-based care. The end is better patient care. As as Daniel just mentioned, our our friend and former colleague, Rashika Fernanda Pule, who is the uh, CEO and co-founder of Iora Health, said to us, value-based care is not the goal. It's better patient care. On this idea, though, of changing how you think, Eric, I'm curious, do you feel like especially health system leaders have to change their mindset from being, I think, in terms of hospitals to, I think, more like an insurance company. I think the other challenge that we've seen is I run a hospital 
or I run a physician group. And my point is that there kind of aren't any hospitals anymore. They're all health systems, mm. right? They all have ambulatory assets. They all have physician assets that they either own or are aligned with. And so they're starting to think about the continuum of care that they manage. Now they need to figure out how to manage that continuum better and actually make money through the delivery of better patient care, right? Like you were talking about. And so they're starting to get there, right? They're starting to break out of these silos. Yeah. But they're starting, yeah. right? We're not done. Yeah. And, and, and on that starting point, I, I get nervous that some folks are almost stalling their efforts because they're waiting for perfect. They're waiting for the right set of assets. Maybe they're waiting for the right leadership and the right mindset. I hear a lot of folks saying that they're waiting for the right data. When it comes to mindset shifts, how do you balance waiting to have the assets that you need to succeed, but not letting perfect being the enemy of the good? curious, Daniel, what you see, because in my client base, I sort of lump my executives into three boats, right? There's the clinical executives, there's the finance executives, and then there are the health system executives. Where do you find that dynamic that Ray just described most dominant? Is it finance? Is it clinical? Or is it system leadership? I think it's finance and clinical, but it's, it's finance and clinical, but it's two different types of data. I think Finance is thinking about one type of data, clinical is thinking about another, and you... And I don't know that they're talking to each other about that either. <laughs> you can't go in unaligned. One of the things people get wrong is going in unaligned. But if you go in like, hey, we need better data, and you don't even have agreement on what the right data is, you are already unaligned, even if you're aligned conceptually. Eric, how do you find it? Ray and I obviously said finance and clinical. It's always finance, right? Um, that's always part of the challenge, part of the education process. I think the clinical, the clinical case is almost easier to make in some respects because right to your point, this is really about delivering better care. Like if you can show me a way that I can deliver better care, I care most about that. The finance challenge is a lot harder because it's multi-year, right? And it's, it's a different set of variables than just volume times rate. Um, so there's a little bit more work to be done there. But the challenge at the end of the day is what Daniel was just describing, yeah. he was like, okay, you've got two very different business cases now. How do you get them aligned yeah. at the executive level so they can agree? And the truth is you, you might not have all of the data or the quote unquote perfect data in house. And you need to be thinking about other partners, or you need to start thinking like an insurance company, like you said, or you start working with an insurance company, like you described in order to get the right complement of materials to, to really feel like you can, to Daniel's point, commit. But if I'm honest, there are a lot of folks who've maybe not made a full commitment, but have at least put more than a toe into the water of their value-based care journey. And now the rose-colored glasses are off. They're in the thick of implementation and they're actually doing the work. And there are also misconceptions and mindset shifts that we want to nudge our listeners and leaders towards when they're in the implementation phase. What are some things that you hear in this part of the value-based care journey? The data is not right. <laughs> yeah. My doctors are mad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My doctors are mad about the data that I'm showing them, perhaps. Yeah. But that's a great, in my experience at least, that, that's been a great um, impetus to performance improvement. Nobody likes to see that they're below average, yeah. particularly. Or nobody, or nobody likes to be, not just be told that they're below average, nobody likes change. And the change management of this is incredibly hard. Perhaps it's especially hard with physicians, but it's incredibly hard. Even just how people think. Uh, Eric made the point earlier about how this change, this is this is not a short-term period. You're not going to beat your margin every single year. To our conversation about finance executives, that is that is completely unheard of for them. Imagine telling a CFO, hey, you're going to crush it year two, three, and four especially in year four, but year one and year five, you're not. That's just, that, that is a yeah. sense of loss. That is a sense of change that most of us are not hardwired for or yeah. trained for. But is the truth about succeeding in this strategy long-term? We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break.
Since 2019, the ENT and Allergy Center of Texas and Stonebridge Surgery Center have improved access to Inspire Sleep Apnea Therapy in Collin County. A new case study from Advisory Board looks at how both organizations transform sleep apnea treatment in the region by performing the procedure in an ambulatory care setting and strengthening relationships with area sleep clinics. Click the link in this episode's show notes to learn more. Since 2021, Advisory Board has surveyed health system strategy leaders to uncover key strategic challenges and priorities. Back in January, we told you that hospital margins weren't growing with volumes. It's become a key story for health systems in 2024, and this survey was the first to point to this ongoing trend. So this year, we want to hear from you. What is your health system focusing on in 2025? Let us know by clicking the link in this episode's show notes. We've also included a link to last year's findings. You're listening to Radio Advisory. I'm Ray Woods. The change management of it all kind of intrigues me. What does meaningful change management look like in this kind of implementation phase? Because it was something that I've been just kind of, that's been itching the back of my brain is when Daniel said, I'm leaving my physicians out of it, or I'm just focused on pop- the population health managers. And I get nervous that that is a reaction to what we've been talking about, which is my physicians aren't going to like the data. My physicians aren't going to be like to be told that they're underperforming. So I'm just going to leave them out of it rather than bring them in to the change management of it all. So what does meaningful change management look like when you're in the thick of it? A lot of our clients start in the in the world of ACOs, right? They start with upside only risk or maybe a little bit of yeah. downside risk. And yep. a lot of folks will argue, well, that's not really risk. And I said, that's okay, right? They need to develop the muscle memory. They need to get used to like looking at data. What does that data look like? What do I do with it? How do I socialize it with my physician leadership and how do they socialize it with their docs, right? And it's okay to take a couple, three years uh, to figure that out just explaining what the data mean, what it means in terms of your next best action. It's it's very painstaking, the change management, but it's also very linear too. I mean, it is a path that you can go down in a fairly predictable way as long as you're patient and, and have the backing of, of clinical leaders. I feel like that's a misconception in and of itself that you are going to that, that your value-based care strategy is going to be kind of closed within a very small part of your organization, right? Um, and the the mindset that you're going to need to be doing more, adding more, changing more, turning up the heat more, uh, and that that is going to be essential for success is a mindset shift in and of itself. And the, the way that I hear this most often is the trap that people get into when they think this is just primary care. All of that, my value-based care strategy is going to begin and end with primary care, which I don't actually think is right. When, when we do this, what should be done, who should do it, and how should be done are all kind of questions we need to reevaluate. We know what that looks like in a world about volume. We don't always know what that looks like in a world about lives. And yeah. in, in primary care, what should be done by who and when and how, all of those things change. But a lot of primary care physicians actually like practicing in a value-based environment. It oh, looks yeah. different in specialty care, and that's okay. Yeah. But people are yeah. afraid to upset their physicians sometimes, and they're afraid to communicate how those changes are going to happen. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. And I, and I think it also depends on who you're taking risk on. Primary care is always going to be sort of a cornerstone of this. Mm-hmm. But you build a house around the cornerstone. You don't just leave it at the cornerstone. Sure. So if you're, if it's Medicare risk, you have to care about post-acute. If it's Medicaid risk, you have to care a lot more about behavioral and pediatrics and maternal and child. I mean, it, it really does start to address the populations that you're taking that risk on, and that's going to drive. You know, the water is going to flow there, um, and I think that is something that if you just think about it as primary care, you're missing. You're missing a lot. At the beginning of this conversation, we talked about red flags. And one for me that I think has only kind of emerged recently as a very big red flag is when folks start talking about doing this alone or when folks start kind of rejecting the the opportunity that partnership could provide them because partnership also always requires sacrifice. And the misconception is 
thinking that partnership is something that is soft rather than realizing that partnership is something that is hard? Is this something that you come across in your conversations? And how do you want to change the way that leaders think about partnership? Partnership is a skill. Uh, in any in any particular format, partnership mm. is a skill, and you cannot do value based care alone. You ne- you need to partner in that regard. Yeah, that can be bringing an outside help. That can be having a deeper relationship with a health plan. That can be bringing in life sciences in a new and innovative way. But you cannot do this alone. And anybody who thinks they can, I bet, is going to lose. I like that partnership is a skill. I, I think that's very true. And we tend not to advise our clients on the consulting side to do this by themselves. Some do, because it makes sense, but it's kind of a bespoke challenge. Mm. But I think the bigger issue is that the partnerships that Daniel was just describing are partnerships that previously had been fairly antagonistic in nature. Oh yeah. That, that mindset that the payer is my ally in this, not my foe or the physician group that I depend on for referrals is somebody I need to partner with as opposed to really beg for referrals. That, that's a big shift in, in the way you think about the ecosystem. Yeah. Talk about a muscle that has not been flexed or a skill that has to be learned partnering with your competitors, partnering with your, your, your <laughs> right. Partnering with folks you haven't partnered with before is, is going to be a challenge. I, I want to do something, go with me on this for a second. I often play the naysayer role when I do these podcasts and have these conversations. And I have to believe that folks that are listening to this are going, oh my gosh, Daniel and Eric and Ray are talking about all the things that the industry is doing wrong in value-based care. And we've been trying to do value-based care for several decades now. And everyone still has the same incorrect mindset, even at the very beginning of their journey. And I have to believe that that naysayer is thinking, what the hell are we doing? Why are we still pushing for payment transformation? What do you say to that naysayer who's listening to this going, gosh, is this even worth it? Well, I think the trains left the station. Um, You know, I think there are enough, again, there's enough competition for the lives out there right now. And there are a lot of large physician groups out there who are grabbing those lives and they're taking delegated risk on those lives. And we know what works, right? And we know how to make the math work. And we know the clinical models that work. And if you're saying no to these things that are, fairly well documented, it's being a little obtuse, in my opinion. Like there's a lot of opportunity here. And I think it's being exploited by a lot of groups out there um, at the expense of folks who have decided to stick their head in the sand and not go down this route. I completely, I'm going to agree with Eric's answer, which is more politically correct than mine. And then I'm going to give my own. Eric, your point is just so well taken. Uh, $20 billion shelled out on one medical plus Iora, um, signify and something else three deals worth 20 billion dollars that's with a b not an m obviously the train has left the station the biggest medical group in the country is all about managing the medicare advantage life the train has left the station that's i think the first thing i would say to the folks who are pushing on the payment transformation piece um can i add one ray absolutely do you like what you're doing now that's the other reason i would push on why payment transformation (laughs) is 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 going to keep going uh, executive turnover is up. The workforce shortage is real. Patient quality is down. Yeah. Does anyone think healthcare is working today? We're not trying in some ways we are no longer trying to fix healthcare. We are just trying to make what we have better. Value-based care might actually, you know, help fix it at a bare minimum. We could make it better. It's why we use the word transformation when we mm-hmm. talk about this, because what we're describing is the need for transformation. And if I'm reflecting on the conversation that we've had, we talked about different stages of the value-based care journey before leaders actually get started when they're in kind of the thick of it. My last question is, if we're talking about transformation, is there actually ever going to be an end to the value-based care journey? Hopefully not. Hopefully we keep getting better at this stuff, right? Yeah. There will be better payment models. There will be better clinical models. Um, there will be better partnership models. It is a competitive marketplace and competitive marketplaces tend not to get to a point of stasis. Um, so I think, I think the 
future is going to be a challenge, but it's exciting to me. Yeah, I, that, that's very hopeful to me. It doesn't feel like, oh God, we're going to be trapped in this forever. It's a very hopeful message to say, we are of course going to commit to changing because we are going to commit to continuously trying to make sure that healthcare is better for the patients that we serve and the providers that deliver care and the communities that we work in. And the people who pay the bills. Yeah, absolutely. Right? The people who pay the bills are sick of these these increases. And so they're gonna demand they are demanding, I think, differences. I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat on this question. I actually do think someday, or at least I hope that someday we're gonna stop talking about value based care because it's no longer gonna, gonna mm. be this standalone thing. It's just gonna be what we do. And we're mm. gonna we, we don't talk about fee for service. We talk about value based care as kind of the change from fee for service. Mm. Someday I hope we get to a world where we're talking about health and wellness and value based care is how you do that. So we don't talk about value based care anymore. Yep. That's just the that's just the foundation. Wow. Well, I, I, I hope we get to that point as well. And I know that the two of you are pushing health leaders to help them get there. So I want to thank you both so much for coming on Radio Advisory. Eric, time number one. <laughs> you've, got, you've, got, you've got one check mark on our, on our leaderboard and we'll, we'll have to have you back. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you both. Thanks, Daniel. Next week on Radio Advisory. When we think about what our ultimate goals are for our company and what we'd like to bring broadly to, to American Healthcare is the ability to say we can deliver care in the home really at the preferred site location, but can also change the level of acuity. New episodes drop every Tuesday. If you like Radio Advisory, please share it with your networks. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a rating and a review. Radio Advisory is a production of Advisory Board. This episode was produced by me, Ray Woods as well as Katie Anderson, Kristen Myers, and Atticus Rosh. The episode was edited by Josh Rogers, with technical support by Dan Tyag, Chris Phelps, and Joe Schramm. Additional support was provided by Claire Worth, Carson Sisk, Leanne Elston, and Aaron Collins. Thanks for listening. Uh, I have a list of icebreakers on my phone. Which one do we want to do?